Good evening. I'm Mel Antler. <laughs> Welcome to our first Facebook Live event. We are here tonight with Amanda and our production department, Tim, <laughs> um, to talk to Amanda about her work, her process, and um, her art. So if you want to be a part of this conversation, uh, there's a link you have to click. Otherwise, we just see you as some anonymous individual. Um, so if you want to be a part of the conversation, you have to click on the link for StreamYard. Um, and then your chats, your questions. The, uh, sorry, just to be, uh, real quick, the, uh, the conversation will be on Facebook. But for us to see who's talking to oh, us, because we're on a different platform, if you just click on, there should be a link above. I'm going to double check it right now. If not, I'll put it in the chat uh, or, or the feed underneath uh, to go to StreamYard to give them permission to uh, use your name from Facebook so we can see who's talking to us and uh, as as uh, Mel and Amanda have their conversation. Thank you, Tim. You're welcome. Hi, Amanda. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> good to see you again. Yeah, you too, Mel. Um, so Amanda and I had an opportunity to talk uh, a couple nights ago, really for the first time. Um, and she's originally from Ewing, born and raised here in Ewing, New Jersey. And um, the other night I asked her about a rumor about her grandfather what used to be the mayor of Ewing. <laughs> um, but it's not your grandfather, right? It's great grandfather. Great grandfather. Although, um, you know, I, I had made a mental note to, uh, to follow up with my uh, father because it's on his side of the family um, about uh, the, the actual, like the oh, facts actually. behind this. And um, I, I, uh, I did not, do that. I did not follow up, but uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Thackeray family has a long history in Ewing, um, and my parents uh, live in a beautiful Victorian house that used to be a Victorian farmhouse, um, and uh, they. I I grew up there, and I lived yes. there my whole life until I went to college. So, Rutgers. did you? Are you a Ewing High graduate as well? Yes. Nice. Myself and all my siblings all your siblings oh, that's awesome. okay. <laughs> um so i really wanted to talk to you about your work and i know that we have two um we have a couple short videos to share um and i want to start with the first one that kind of shows your process um so for people who don't know amanda's work if you, in case you haven't checked her out prior to tonight um she's a printmaker um who is deeply into paper making and it's really quite fascinating um if you've ever made paper before when you look at this process you'll sort of understand what's happening i've done it it took me a few minutes to really be able to figure out what i was looking at um and then to sort of understand it but it's really kind of cool mm -hmm. so i want everybody to share that um i wanted to share that with everybody before we take a quick peek at it tim
Awesome. Thank you. So the other night when we spoke, um, one of the things we talked about is um, I had, you know, gone and out and looked at your website. And before I really understood what your work was about, I, I sort of had this very sort of like ocean feel to it. Um, like those pieces that we just saw, like visually, they reminded me of nets. Um, and then when we spoke, you had talked about um, sort of how you arrived at those ideas um, mm -hmm. because it was like pleasantly, it was pleasant for me to find out like, oh, like that was the vibe I was getting from the work. And then in fact, the work has a strong connection to it. So would you, would you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so I guess um, I started thinking about the ocean um, when I had, uh, you know, I, Okay, sorry, let me start over. Um, <laughs> after grad school, I, I had a really amazing opportunity. Um, I uh, got accepted to a residency in the Arctic Circle. Oh my um, God. And I, it was on a ship, a tall ship, which, you know, uh, has sails and rope and all these things. And I was kind of obsessed with rope at the time. I was making a lot of my work about rope and knots. And I still kind of am to a certain extent, but... Um, I was interested in making work about the ship and kind of being there as we sailed. But, uh, you know, we were sailing through the ocean and, and having really uh, strong experiences with water. And I started thinking about the ocean in a very different way uh, because I had only really experienced uh, the ocean at the shoreline, you know, going to the right. Jersey Shore or going right. to lakes and rivers and things like that. Um, so right. being in the ocean, yeah, it was super formative for me. Um, and so I started reading more about the ocean and, you know, I'm, I'm a very um, uh, environmentally minded person. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I started reading about microplastics and how they um, have become such a big issue right. in the ocean. Um, and I started yeah, reading yeah. about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Yeah. And so that sort of changed the trajectory of my work. And and um, part of, uh, a big part of my work right now is making work about ghost nets. Um, and ghost nets are um, a phenomenon uh, where um, nets from, from the global fishing industry are guarded. Right. Yeah, or on purpose. Um, and they sort of uh, float through the ocean and gather all sorts of, yeah. They gather wildlife, they kill things, they create ecosystems, it's a very, um, kind of a really crazy phenomenon. And yeah. um, so this was actually something I wanted to talk to you about a little bit more because um, because I was so impressed with your credentials <laughs> when I was like, you know, cyber stalking you. And um, I was like, wow, right? She's an artist, you've done curating, you're a professor um, at a couple of different colleges. Um, you've authored papers. Um, and now you've sort of added, not directly, but indirectly, like activists, like artists as mm -hmm. social engager, um, which I think is huge because I think that's a huge part of what artists generally tend to do. You know what I mean? Like, these yeah. sort of, we leave behind things that are prominent of the time period we are living in. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think, um, um, you know, our artists are able to do a really special thing. We can uh, raise awareness about um, issues or, you know, things that are important to us. And um, we can do that in a really sneaky way, right? Like some uh, uh, socially engaged and environmental and social justice artwork is really in your face. Um, and that's not the kind of work that I make. I, I make sneaky work. I make work that like maybe uh, you see it and maybe you think that it's uh, pretty or interesting and it's abstract and you don't really uh, get to that content until you take a little bit of a deeper look. Yeah. So I like to pull people in with aesthetics first and then, um, you know, kind of um, drop the uh, the environmentalism and, and right. the activism in kind of like on the back end mm -hmm. um, and have conversations with people in galleries. And it's a really big part of my work, but I think that, um, you know, I, I also 
want to make work that I enjoy making and I enjoy looking at, despite the really serious um, nature of the content. Right. So um, when you left high school, you went right to college, right? Mason Gross. Mm -hmm. um, and then I happened to notice that there was like a four year or sorry, an eight year gap between undergrad and graduate school. Um, and you shared with me the other day a little bit about like what that time period was like for you. And I would, I would love for you to share that again, because um, I think it's really important for people to sort of like understand the life of an artist yeah. at that level. Um, one of the, one of the things you and I talked about was that, you know, I, my undergraduate is a BFA, but it's in graphic design. So when I left college, it was like any sort of typical work, you know, like I had to apply, there was like some very definite steps that you took, but for you, it was quite a different journey. And I, my real question was, hey, why so many years between and what did that look like? So would you share? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when I um, when I graduated from uh, Rutgers, I ended up moving to Jersey City. And, you know, it's sort of like an accident for me. I had a good friend who wanted to move to Jersey City. And I said, yeah, that sounds great. Let's go, right? Right, you know, right across the river from Manhattan. Um, a lot of things just kind of made sense at that point. Um, and, you know, my first job and many of my jobs after that were not in the arts industry at all. They were just kind of like money making jobs. And for a little while, I didn't make art at all. Uh, probably, probably like a good couple months, um, maybe even six months or so. And, and it was kind of depressing. It was, it was, you know, I was happy to be with my, with my friends living in, in the right. city and, and meeting new people. But, um, but I didn't realize that um, I needed to find my way into making my own art. Um, and it was difficult for me because up until that point, um, you know, my entire life and my career as an artist was in school. It was in the institution. Right. So right, with someone sort of yeah. directing you to make work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the, all the work was assigned <laughs> based and, you know, I did stuff on my own, but I really didn't know how to function as an artist uh, outside right. of that um, structure. So it was really important for me to figure out how to do it. Um, I actually got a really nice push from uh, the uh, special collections librarian at Rutgers, Michael Joseph, who I still call a dear friend. Um, he invited me to share my work at the New Jersey Book Arts Symposium. And that really gave me a push to start making work again and to start thinking about like, you know, who I was as, as an artist outside of school. Right, to establish um, yourself yeah. as an independent artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's difficult to do. Yeah, and um, so I always advise my students uh, because, you know, a lot of times they ask me for advice about, you know, what grad schools to choose and when to go. And, and I always like to tell people to take a couple years off because uh, school is really expensive. You know, if you're not super lucky and you get a full ride, right. you're at least paying, you know, thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars yes. for an education, which might be super exciting and wonderful and 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 really benefit your career. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, if you've never existed as a person in the world, I think it's yeah, really important. I think to... that like that personal time mm -hmm. um, is a huge period of growth. Yeah. Um, to allow you to take that next step with more intent and more responsibility. Um, Grad school is nothing to, you know, laugh about. It's intense. Mm -hmm. It's hard work. Um, yeah. And, and I do think you time, even... little time between does really help you, you know, mature as a as an artist, as a person, and mm -hmm. to, to figure out what's next. And to know if that's even something that you want to do, right? Right. Uh, because, um, you know, most of my life as an artist, I've, I've been working other jobs, sometimes 40 hours a week, sometimes even more than that, because often, you know, I do kind of gig work and I do um, multiple jobs at the same right. time. And, you know, you if you want a studio, you have to, it's like having a second rent, right? And Absolutely. materials and all these things, they cost money. And unless you're independently wealthy, um, you have to figure out how to, um, how to have multiple careers at the same time, right? You have your right. money making career, you have your artwork, and then you also have to be like your own publicist, your own archivist. You right. have to, you know, um, yeah, it's 
And now in the digital age, you have to be a social media marketer. Right. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Wow. You have to learn how to like. To <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's take a look at some of your work. I know we have another quickie video. Um, and what is this video is about which particular piece? Um, so do you, do you want me to, I can go through the slideshow first and then when we get to that piece, then okay. that would be awesome. the video. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Great. um, I have, I have like a ton of slides. I'm going to go through them really <laughs> quickly. Um, but I feel like they, they kind of like, um, it's like a nice, uh, history of my practice. Um, not the whole thing, but you know. Um, the history of kind of how I got to where I am now, I would say. All right. When we talked the other day, you mentioned a, um, a show you had coming up. Yeah, yeah. So I am super excited about a solo show that I'm going to be having at um, NJCU, which is New Jersey City University, uh, the Lemmerman Gallery. Um, in the fall of right. this year. So um, I'm working on uh, some work for that show right now and probably through the summer. Um, right. But uh, that that work is, uh, or, or sorry, that show is centered around my work um, with the ocean and, right. and thinking about like anthropogenic um, detritus in, in, in the ocean. So nice. um, yeah. Okay, so let me go through. Here really quickly if you have any questions um mel you can just let me know okay so this is um sorry that was me <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned that i have a background in uh in printmaking so that's absolutely true i have my bfa in printmaking and also my mfa in printmaking um and i teach printmaking i teach printmaking at both uh suny purchase what's that I'm sensing a theme. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, is this a print? Is yeah. This something? That's, that's oh my gosh. Say. So I'm not wow. gonna show a whole lot of prints because a lot of my personal practice is uh, paper-based, but this is a stone lithograph. Um, and lithography is is a medium that I teach uh, quite often at SUNY Purchase. Um, I love it. I'm actually teaching it right now and yes. we're having a really wonderful Anyone time. Anyone knows anything about lithography, it is intense. Yeah, you had to teach it online in the spring last year, right? It just was. Yeah, la well, so la last year in the spring, uh, we were in person up until like mid March, and then we had to go online. And unfortunately, you know, there wasn't a whole lot we could do. Right. Uh, because yeah, lithography uh, is a chemistry intensive process that involves like serious equipment. Yes. Uh, we use a uh, hundred year, like multi hundred year old limestones. Uh, to create prints using, you know, uh, serious, like we etch with acid and, yep. and we use big presses. Crazy. So yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful, I mean, it's process. awesome, but it's crazy. Yeah. 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 It's a lot. Um, and I'm super happy that I can be back this semester because my school has been really on top of testing and, and doing a good job with keeping everyone safe. Yeah. So, um, so that I want to start with this because, you know, I, I said that I got into the ocean by thinking through like ropes and knots and things like that. So this is, um, this is an example, uh, I call this infinity splice because you can see it's like the infinity symbol, but it also is the beginning of a rope splice, which is sort of like, um, something that, uh, you you could use in lieu of a knot, right? You could splice pieces of rope together, which I'm really interested about. Um, and I wanted to go from there to talk about paper ropes. So for um, for years now, I've been making my own rope out of paper. Um, so I use uh, Korean and Japanese paper. Um, and in Korean paper making, twisting paper cords is known as jisung. And in Japanese paper making, they have a process of making paper thread that is known as shifu. So I use these processes together to make my own rope. And um, yeah, and then I make sculptures from that. It's a really time intensive process. I was, yes, I was gonna say, right it now. must be. Yeah, I like processes that are that take a lot of time and I find a lot of meditation in them. Um, so here I have a couple. What's that? Art is therapy. I'm a firm believer. Yeah, I, I believe that for sure. Um, yeah. I mentioned this before, but 
you know, that you always hear about certain processes mm -hmm. um, and like watching the video and with my own students, I, I teach high school now, but I have taught all grades. Yeah. You know, work with your hands. You're doing hands on stuff, either printmaking or like with clay. And the kids are always saying it's so satisfying. Mm -hmm. There's that connection, yeah. you know, the physical connection to what you're doing that seems yeah. to like, you know, entrance the whole body, not just the mind, not just the yeah. hand. But and like, it's super yeah. important as we get more and more digital, I think, you know, I teach artist books classes as well. Um, and, you know, I think it's really important for people to make artist books because uh, they give us a reason to engage with books as we like read less and less uh, things in books and more online. Um, artist books are oftentimes, you know, the kinds of books that uh, need that format to, to sort of make yes. their point. So um, last yeah. year with one of my high school classes, I actually did a bookmaking project with them. Oh, um, great. And yeah, we made just little tiny, it was sketchbooks for them mm -hmm. to do the work. Excuse me, I have to yell at the cat. Hey, <laughs> put it. Yeah, you. Sorry. <laughs> She's like on the paper. No, it's okay. Um, but the kids were mm -hmm. like, this, it was so chaotic. You know, there's so many steps. It was so foreign to them. Yeah. But the kids, I mean, they stuck with it and we like had a, um, a cutter to trim the page edges and they mm -hmm. sewed all their own signatures. We bound the whole thing. And at the end, they all stood around with like their faces in awe. They had this thing in their hands yeah. that they made. Making and it had purpose. Making sketchbooks are yeah. is like particularly amazing. exciting. Yeah. yeah. They were like 72 pages. They weren't huge books, but we did hard bound covers and that's amazing. Wow, like, that's a lot fun. of skill. <laughs> I love it. So I was like, yeah, yeah. you're making your own sketchbooks. Yeah, that's great. I, I always, um, when I teach artist books, I teach a lot of really conceptual assignments and I pair them with like structural books as well. And I always leave the structural books blank because I think that uh, letting them utilize it as a notebook or a sketchbook is really, you know, it's really exciting when you can make your own tools. Right. And, you know, and, and then once they learn that they can, they can keep making them. Right. Forever. So, yeah. So I wanted to go back to these slides real quick. So this is the paper rope. And then this is a performance that I did uh, at the Newark museum and that at the, at the Venus knitting space in Brooklyn um, with a colleague of mine, Milka Bassel. Um, and uh, this was a performance that was focused on the process of making that paper rope. So you can see that I'm twisting um, mm -hmm. the paper and then Milka would uh, sort of like transform it with her body in space. And it was a really exciting um, performance because, uh, you know, I, I, um, I sort of feel like a, like a art labor activist or like, you know, I, because I, I so much of my work does uh, take so much time. And I think that when you see it, you don't always um, see that time. So I like to uh, really try to find ways to put the put the labor at the forefront if I can. So right. that, um, you know, because uh, a lot of times when people would look at my like this sculpture, they would read the materials and see this made out of paper, but they wouldn't. Um, really comprehend with that. Right. Meant. Yeah. It yeah. adds a deeper, um, deeper meaning, deeper, what's the word I'm looking for? Enlightenment. Yeah. Yeah. And just even like, you know, the time, the time commit, like the, you know, maybe a hundred hours of time that are involved in creating something like this that actually looks pretty simple, right? Because it, it um, you know, it looks like it could be made of twine. Right. right. And and then, you know, if that's just sort of uh, turned into a net, that's a certain amount of labor. But actually creating that uh, the rope itself and and doing it from a delicate material like paper really um, kind of adds a whole different layer to it. Right. So, it's it's actually a little bit mind blowing. <laughs> so I did um, in 2000. Uh, 19 until I was very lucky. I, my residency 
was over um, January 2020. So just a couple months before the pandemic, but I had a, a residency at the Museum of Art and Design, which is on at Columbus Circle. And it was, uh, it was a kind of residency where uh, we were open to the public, right? So I would be working and then anyone who came to see the exhibits in the museum, they'd come up the elevator and they'd walk into my studio and they'd get to engage with me while I was working. And um, I uh, chose this specific process to highlight during that residency because I wanted to talk about that labor. So, um, and you know, people would see me doing the technique, they'd see me right. twisting the paper together and they still wouldn't, sometimes they still wouldn't Im immediately understand. Right, being able um, to digest and connect right. the two pieces. Yeah, 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 it was interesting. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to the Arctic Circle. So um, I, uh, I went to the Arctic Circle on this uh, ship, the tall ship Antigua, um, the year after I finished graduate school. And I, um, I was making paper rope when I was here too. So I was here to think about the ship, to, to uh, think about how like this rope connects to our bodies and how it enables like, you know, um, multiple people to kind of become a machine, which, you know, I find super interesting. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I was surrounded by all different kinds of water. I was surrounded by oceans. I was surrounded by glaciers, icebergs, also wow. reindeer. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it just made me uh, start to clued me into thinking about the ocean. So these were the ropes that I was interested in. And, you know, it it sort of became a seamless transition when um, this is a, a paper rope sculpture that I collaborated on with a poet who was also in residence. And he he wrote a poem onto the paper and then I twisted it. So the poem is sort of contained within. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And you can sort of see like little bits and and pieces of, of yep. uh, you know, some text, but you can't actually read it because it's it's truly contained within that's a great idea um, thanks yeah i've done a little bit more with that since um i actually i'm gonna i i have work um that is also it's a paper rope sculpture uh that has text twisted into it and it's um it's going up at the paul robeson gallery here um oh, very nice. work. yeah yeah and that's and it's a, it's a show an exhibition that is based on artwork with text and that's opening, I think, this month. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and I made an artist book about my uh, my time in Svalbard in the Arctic Circle. And there's just a couple pages from it. Um, and then, uh, you know, this is sort of my transition period. So um, this, this was a, a sculpture that I made. It's a paper sculpture. Um, and it's made from laser cut paper. And I did a couple of pieces like this where I was trying to uh, trying to find new ways of like twisting paper into sculpture. So this is actually quite large. I think it's uh, it's uh, you know you can see it's piled up at the bottom, but I think it's three hundred feet long. Oh my gosh! Um, yeah, so it's taller than me, um, and it kind of um, as it piles up and it it creates layers and and they kind of create moiré effects where. Um, you know, uh, the different colors layering create optical effects. Right. Uh, so there's a, a detail of it. And yeah, so this is just another, like still working with nets and trying to figure out how to um, utilize paper in different ways. Um, and then this is also a, uh, a sculpture that is made with paper um, in, a, in a totally different way. So this is called Periphera and this was, um, on exhibit at Index Center, um, Index Art Center in Newark. Um, and it's, I, I made a, a net out of twine and then I dipped it into abaca paper fiber. So the abaca formed a skin. Um, and it's sort of a meditation on um, the glass sea sponge. So uh, you see below, that's a glass sea sponge skeleton. Um, and it's a really cool, um, underwater creature that I'm uh, still really fascinated by and still making work about. Um, but you can see how I'm trying to mimic 
uh, the skeleton of the sea sponge with the paper? Yeah, it has like, the first impression of it is like some sort of crazy sea creature. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has that sort of like science fictional appeal about it. Yeah. Yeah, um, and there, you know, there's a lot of um, underwater creatures that do seem sort of like science fiction, right? right? Like, how how is a sea sponge made of glass? How is that possible? Right. You know, it's not. Um, and I guess you know, it's interesting because uh, I was drawn to making work about this creature because I was reading. You know, I, I've done some work with glass, and I was reading about. Um, Corning scientists and and you know glass scientists that have been researching uh, the glass sea sponges because they um, they want to try to mimic its uh, way of pro producing uh, glass because um, human beings only know how to produce glass at high temperatures, right. uh, but the glass sea sponge actually produces biologically produces glass at very low temperatures and it actually makes for a much stronger and much more flexible glass that we don't know how to make so right. it's still, like insane to think about I'm just, yeah, <laughs> yeah 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 they're still trying to figure it out um I also read recently that um the glass sponge sea roots go really deep into the ocean and if we you know they can live for a really long time they're really old creatures um and if we look at the roots we can kind of like learn um we can learn about global uh, temperature changes. So um, we can learn about global warming through looking at the roots of these sea sponges, sort of like, awesome. yeah, yeah, it's yeah. They're, they're really interesting, really exciting creatures. It's so fascinating um, how everything is connected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we, can, we can learn a lot by just looking at nature. Right. Right, like nature can, tell us what we're doing wrong <laughs> and kind of how to fix it. Right. Uh, we just need to listen. Um, okay. We do have to keep an eye on the time. We're actually a few minutes past our. Okay. So I'm. Uh, I, I, I do want to share this second video because it's really okay. cool. Yeah. 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 So let me uh, just go a couple more slides yeah. in and then we'll be yeah. right with that place. So, um, so this is the great Pacific garbage patch, which I came to make work about through thinking about the ocean and you can see it has these two little gyres that are uh, sort of uh, east and west of Hawaii. Um, and I started uh, working on a project called a thousand square feet, which uh, attempts to sort of uh, simulate a thousand square feet of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, and it is made uh, using handmade paper um, and the handmade paper uses site specific water. So it's really important for me for this project that I embed myself in a place, right? So I have to use the water um, and I have to use it locally. So I get to sort of be in this place and talk to residents, talk to people that are there, um, find out about like the waterways where I am. So I started this in Eastport and then here I am. Um, I collect garbage from the waterway and um, I make mono printed plates and I uh, do um, suminagashi, which is a Japanese um, paper marbling. You right. can see that here on the right. So it sort of um, simulates, it has like a watery look to it because of how it's created. And then I use these little uh, plates that are um, designed to mimic the shapes of the garbage that I find in the waterway. And I uh, use watercolor monoprint to um, uh, to transfer these plates to uh, to the paper. And so this is what the installation looks like. This was uh, just this past wow. summer um, in Long Island City. I was able to install uh, the whole project to date. So this is 400 square feet. And as I said before, I'm aiming to get to 1,000 square feet. So this is less than half of what I want to do. Um, but each one of these pieces of paper is 12 inches by 12 inches, and they're from four different sites. So the first one is Eastport, Maine. The second one is from the Meadowlands here in New Jersey. Uh, the third is from Benin, which is a country in West Africa. And then the fourth is um, from Easton, Pennsylvania, where I had a show that also featured this work. Wow. So here's a uh, detail and then we can 
watch the video if you want. Cue the video. All right, here we go. <laughs> advertise the dancing next time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that was the installation process um, of, awesome. of the work in Long Island City. And, and that actually, it took me um, literally like 12 hours from 10 a.m. Oh to 10 p.m. to see that piece. I think I stopped for like 10 minutes to like eat a sandwich. Um, <laughs> the rest of the time I was just going um, and you know, I hadn't expected it, but I just kind of, just kind of did it. And I was lucky that, um, I had some help, but it still took us 12 hours. Um, so next time I will plan better. I will have, I will, uh, I will take breaks. I will, uh, it up <laughs> into a couple of days, but, um, What's a really yeah, Alyssa said that the you and green team would love this. <laughs> yes. I just, that just popped up on my screen. Yes, they would. I could not agree more. <laughs> We might be talking to you later about some of the crossover <laughs> work. I would love to meet them. Um, okay, so okay. Um, let me just, I'll go through the rest super quick. Okay. okay. You got a good audience. Um, Take your time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the rest is, um, you know, this sort of like brought me back to, well, actually, uh, this piece brought me back to paper making. This was the piece where I uh, decided to start making handmade paper again, which it had been a couple of years. Um, then I kind of got here, right, with this piece. Um, and then uh, when I when I was at the Museum of Art and Design, I uh, I did a public workshop, um, which was a, a pulp painting workshop, which was it, it went so wonderfully and it was great. But um, I had no idea how much paper pulp to bring, and um, I had a lot left over. And um, they let me take it home because they, you know, they didn't have any use for it. So I ended up with a couple big bags of pigmented paper pulp. Nice. And, um, yeah. And then right after that happened, we were in quarantine. And luckily for me, my studio is a couple blocks from my apartment. Um, so I was able to kind of like spend a lot of time there and just play around. Right. And so you actually have time to concentrate on your work. Yeah, yeah. There's it, an idea. It, um, yeah, without, without uh, any FOMO, right? Like, yeah. Like, nothing was happening, so I could just be in my studio. Wow. Yeah, so I did so a how couple much paper of... Did you uh, make? What's that? that? How much paper did you end up making? <laughs> I mean, I, I honestly... So, like, I... My my, I made this paper with my friend Milka, who you saw earlier. She was my uh, performance collaborator, oh, yeah. and um, and we made the paper so well. We did such a good job that I still have some, and it's still good. It like hasn't gone moldy or anything because we use the right additives to like kind of nice. help it stay fresh. So I am still using this pulp because that's how. I mean, it wasn't the thing is like you need a lot. And uh, it goes a long way. So cool. I, uh, I oops started experimenting with frayed rope uh, pictures, and then I started experimenting more. Right? I did. I did a couple of tiny pieces, and I really liked what they looked like. And then I, uh, I end up making this piece. Um, and from there, I uh, here's here's a detail. So you can see that okay. it um, it doesn't have a base sheet. When you see the white, that's actually the white of the wall. So what I started doing was actually just drawing with the paper pulp rather than, um, you know, rather than applying it to another surface. I just uh, drew onto like my Pellon substrate and then peeled it off. Um, and that was the video that we saw at the beginning. Okay, that's what really. I was just about to ask. Mm -hmm. this, yeah. As a result, these um, materials that we're seeing are a result of that process. Yep, yeah. Okay, so cool. you can see that it's just sort of like, it becomes an, a, a real net, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, so like it exists in space as a net, even though it's made out of paper. And then here is a pile of nets in like a shipyard, which uh, inspired me, you know, images like that inspired me to make this piece, which is a kind of like an installation of a bunch of different uh, pieces put together. Um, and then here is a Google search for ghost nets. Um, so, you know, I, I've been doing a lot of research into this into into ghost nets and um, this piece here, uh, which is actually um, at a show in San Francisco um, at the San Francisco Center for uh, for the book, and that's opening. I think um, I think it opens in June. Yeah, yeah. So this is quite large. This is eight feet long, so it's really wow. big. it's taller than me. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And this is made using the same process. So here you can see a detail of it. Um, and then I have this piece, which is, um, you know, these are the drops that you were seeing me make and, and then peel off. And, and this is, uh, this was at a show um, at the end of last summer, I had a, a small show in the project space at Gutenberg Arts. And um, I call this uh, uh, surface tension. And it's sort of like, um, you know, utilizing this net shape, but it's also, uh, really about like the melancholy of like environmental issues. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's sort of like, there's sort of raindrops, but they're also sort of teardrops maybe too. Um, yeah, so that's the kind of stuff that I'm thinking about now. Um, and then this is a, a shot of my studio in Newark. Um, it's upstairs at Galleria Faro, and yes. my studio is a little bit of a mess, so that's just kind of how I work. Um, <laughs> and you can see a lot of my work on the wall, so you can kind of like see the scale of it. Um, and then here's my working wall, right? So this is a lot of the stuff that I'm working on oh, right, right now. Neat. Yeah. And I'm working on a big installation. So awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank I was, you. I was a really bad host. I didn't plug your website or your Instagram. No, it's okay. Well, it's all good. It's, it's, it's been rolling along the bottom. <laughs> and uh, I want to yeah, thank. So uh, go to her website. Okay. Look at her work. <laughs> um, look at her CV. Be, be <laughs> so uberly impressed as I was. Um, the work is really beautiful, and I'm so thankful that you were able to share it with us today. Um, and yeah, thank you. I really appreciate you. Artist for our virtual featured artist of the month. It was great to talk yeah, to you. Cool to bring this together. Thank and yes, yeah, so everybody, make sure you follow uh, Amanda Amanda Tax on uh, Instagram <laughs> and check out her website. And uh, also Ewing underscore arts on instagram follow That's our right. instagram page and uh we'll be hopefully doing Facebook. some more of these uh, right uh, and uh we'll hopefully be doing some more of these events and so thank you for joining us and uh thanks amanda yeah and glad we Have were a great night. Out.